You don't have any major serious problem with the way Sebi has responded or the way Madhubi Butch has responded to the Hindenburg allegations starting January 2023. On the basis of information that I have, I don't have any major problem. You don't have any major problem? On the basis of information that I presently have. So are you saying Sebi did a good job or are you saying Sebi did not do a good job? Which of the two? I am saying I do not have evidence to show that Sebi didn't do a good job. In other words, on the basis of what you know, you are happy to believe and say Sebi did a good job. On the basis of what I know, I believe that uh, I cannot say Sebi did a bad job. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Have Sebi the regulator and Madhubi Puri Butch, its chairperson, handled the Hindenburg allegations effectively and adequately or have they fallen woefully short? That's the key issue I shall put today to one of the most highly regarded former chairman of Sebi, M. Damodaran. Mr. Damodaran, I want to talk to you about the way Sebi as the regulator and Madhubi Puri Butch as its chairperson have responded to the Hindenburg allegations. Let's first focus on the most recent allegations made earlier this month before we go back to the earlier allegations made in January 2023. Now, there is a view that when the regulator and the chairperson herself face allegations, the response cannot be anonymous. Second, nor can either is exonerate themselves. The response, it said, should have come from the Ministry of Finance and not from SEBI. Do you agree with that view? Uh, no, I don't agree with that view. Let me give you upfront my response to that question, whether I agree or not. What is involved is credibility. Credibility of the individual, credibility of the organizing. Now, the individual and her husband have put out a statement. SEBI has put out a statement explaining what its view is on the basis of facts available to it. And I think there the matter ends as far as SEBI is concerned because there is a code of conduct and they seem to have acted in accordance with what the code of conduct. Now, secondly, the response was issued on a Sunday night and it's said to be vague and imprecise. It defends the chairperson without carrying out any inquiry, and it claims that she recused herself in matters of potential conflicts of interest without specifying whether that applies to the Adani investigation or not. Would you accept that this is inadequate and insufficient? No, when you say it is impre imprecise and inadequate and insufficient, you have to look at the totality of the SEBI response or what I call the SEBI press release. Is it a response? We'll get to that later. Now, it came on Sunday, but it came within two days, I suspect, of the uh, Hindenburg release. It was not much late. Number, one. Number two is, while it did not get into specific transactional details, it did address two issues which you referred to. One, was there recusal when it was warranted? Two, was there disclosure when it was warranted? This whole issue revolves around disclosure and recusal. The semi press release indicates that both these boxes were ticked and that there was no shortcoming. That is a semi press release. Some people might believe it, some might not. Some might say it came from the organization. The credibility of the organization itself is under attack. But I cannot honestly conceive what else they could have done within two days. They couldn't have carried out an inquiry into this. So they must have looked at, have disclosures been made? Have recusals taken place? And they satisfied themselves. I am sure at a very senior level in said. So you have no problem either with the fact 
that the response did not come from the finance ministry, it came from SEBI, nor with the fact that some people say the response is vague, imprecise, inadequate. On both those counts, you disagree with that view. As far as the first one is concerned, absolutely. I don't think the ministry ought to jump into the gun. SEBI is the organization whose credibility is in question because of this. And I think SEBI responds to it. They don't need to fire off the shoulders of the ministry in this matter. As far as the response itself is concerned, I think they cover the broad areas that the allegation sets up. One of the things we must remember, this is critical, is SEBI cannot get out there into the open and have a slanging match with somebody who is a private organization. But too sequentially, this has come after a show cause notice issued by SEBI. Therefore, for somebody to send this after the show cause notice was issued, and for SEBI then to get out into the public and defend itself in terms of transactional details, I don't think is warranted. I've always taken the view, I've expressed it. Regulation is never conducted in the marketplace. It's conducted in the office of the So you have no problem with SEBI's response, full stop? Yes. Okay. Let's then move beyond the recent allegations made earlier this month in August to the original allegations made 19 months ago in January 2023. We now know that the chairperson, Madhavi Butch, and her husband, Havel, had investments in the Global Dynamic Opportunities Fund, which was part of the same Bermuda Mauritius Fund structure used by Vinod Adani, the elder brother of Gautam Adani. What we don't know is whether this was disclosed to SEBI, whether it was disclosed to the Supreme Court, whether it was disclosed to the Supreme Court appointed committee. Two questions. First, does the public have a right to know whether this disclosure was made or not. Is it important for the public to know? I think it's important for the public to know that there exists a system in place to tackle such exigencies and to deal with such matter, which is the code of conduct and adherence to the code of conduct. That's one. Secondly, as far as disclosures to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court appointed committee is concerned, I do not know, nor do I think there was, must have been an occasion. Supreme Court was looking at larger issues rather than individual disclosures. At that point of time, second allegation had not come, if you recall. But you're Secondly, making a very important point, sir. You're saying yes. it's important for the public to know that there is a system in place Absolutely. to look into yes. this matter, but it's yes. not important for the public to know what that system found. Let me get back to the Code of Conduct for 30 seconds. The Code of Conduct says disclosures should be made by the members to the chairperson, by the chairperson to the board, and then they should be maintained by the secretary of the board confidentially and they're not meant to be disclosed. This is what the Code of Conduct says. These disclosures, therefore, will not be made to the public. In the other public words, needs to know there is a system. Other words, in yes. other words, the system yes. requires that disclosures should be made. Yes. However, yes. it is not important for the public to know whether they were made and what their content was. Neither of those. It's important. Certainly the content is not important. As to whether they were made, I think if there is a system that is in place for want of evidence to the contrary, I would like to believe that what that code of conduct provides has been fully complied with. Let me quote to you what Sucheta Dalal, the managing editor of Money Life, has written and what she separately said to me in an interview. She believes that the failure to confirm whether disclosures were made about Madhavi Put investing in Global Dynamic Opportunities Fund is raising worrying questions. And those questions ought not to be there. In other words, the system may require that closures should be made, but if we don't know whether they were in fact made or not, then there are worrying questions, and she says those are very concerning questions. How do you respond to her view? You know, Sucheta is a very respected voice and somebody whose opinions um, I certainly give a lot of importance to, but that said, we don't know whether disclosures were made, we don't know whether they were not made. Why do we presume they were not made? Because Why do we presume they were made? 
Well, I think uh, normally the uh, burden of proof should be on those who allege that they were not made. Why can't there be confirmation that those disclosures were made? I think the uh, press release of SEBI says clearly, both in terms of the disclosures and recusals, that whatever needed to be done was done. Well, and no, forgive me. Let me interrupt you, sir. Yeah. The press release from SEBI simply says, and I'm quoting, that yes. she recused herself in matters of potential conflicts of interest. It doesn't yes. specify whether that applies to the Adani investigation or not. That lack of specificity is creating doubt, and that doubt is raising worrying questions. This is why I put this issue to you. See, the press release is a document meant for the public to understand what it means to understand. And therefore, the press release will not get into transactional details about which company, which investment. So when they say recusals were made, there must be a context in which recusals were made. So that those recusals must have been made because there was a feeling that maybe she was not entirely free from potential conflict and therefore decided not to deal with these matters. That's the way I read it. So in other words, in yes. other words, you believe yes. that the press release has given enough and sufficient material and information to the public. You believe enough and sufficient material and information has been given to the public. I think information to the extent that the public needs to know that this serious matter that impacts on SEBI's credibility. I am less about individuals, more about the institution. That SEBI's credibility having come into question whether directly or derived from an attack on his chairperson, uh, Sebi has responded by saying that this is our finding, not that they did an inquiry, but they must have looked at documents. And derived. Okay. In other words, you are defending the adequacy of the response from Sebi. That's what you're doing. Contextually, I think that response is adequate. If more details are required, a court asks for it. I am sure Sebi will come up with those details in an appropriate manner. Let me ask you a specific question about whether Madhavi Butch recused herself from any investigation carried out by Sebi into the Hindenburg allegations. Again, I'm quoting Sucheta Dalal. She says categorically, it is clear that MPB, Madhavi Puri Butch, led the investigation. If she led the investigation, she clearly did not recuse herself, given that she had a connection with the Global Dynamic Opportunities Fund, which may or may not have been disclosed. Should she have recused herself from the actual leading of the investigation? I think it all uh, depends on what is leading of the investigation. There are two aspects to this. One, as I mentioned, it is whole time members that deal with these matters. Executive directors and whole time members deal with individual matters, ordinary, ordinary. There could be large systemic issues where the chairperson tends to uh, maybe get involved as a part of the process. I don't know. I'm speculating. But it is mostly whole time members who deal with it. So when you say led the investigation, we do not know what transpired in regard to examination in files of those 24 or 22 matters. What we know is that the presentation to the committee appointed by the court was made by her. That is something that is known. Would it have been appropriate for her to say, look, I won't make this presentation, but at that point of time, you remember, there was no public allegation and she possibly believed that there was nothing standing in the way of doing There, this. there may not have been yes. a public allegation, yes. but she knew yes. that she was an investor in the Global Dynamic Opportunities Fund. She knew it. And therefore, on that basis of what she knew about her own investments, should she have recused herself? Should she have at least not made that presentation to the Supreme Court? They may not. No, have I think the public. I, I think there was an her. expectation. There was an expectation that whoever is heading the organization will make the presentation. It's a Supreme Court appointed committee. And what is the presentation? Making available facts relating to what Hindenburg had said in the first uh, 19 months ago, whatever they had put out. And those are matters where on the basis of, it's not personal information she's talking about. Talking about what is available in SEBI, making a presentation. And as you know, the committee did 
make some observations on what more needed so, to so, be so done. once it's again a... you're defending yeah. the fact that she presented the report to the supreme court you don't think she should have shied away from doing so and made someone else do it and you're also defending the fact that she led the investigation you're not agreeing with the view that she should have recused herself Karen, let me put this to you bluntly if she recused herself either from the presentation or from any other aspect of this. In some sense, Sevi's position would have been weakened vis-a-vis -vis Hindenburg, which is at the end of the day a private entity. I'm not getting into whether it's a short seller, has it conducted itself properly? Not part of my brief. I don't understand. Right? Should her stepping down not be perceived as a kind of admission that Okay, I think we have a problem, and therefore I'm asking one of my whole time members to present this. And I'm sure during the presentation, the whole time members were there, they would have assisted, they would have contributed to the presentation. But that itself, in some, in no sense, uh, you know, prejudices the position that has been taken. Okay, I, I hear your point. Let me come back with one last question on this issue before I move to other issues. And once again, I'm going to quote Moneyline. In a recent article on the 21st of August, I believe it was, Sucheta Dalal says that the chairperson of SEBI should be required to recuse herself, not just when there is a conflict of interest, but also when there is the appearance of a conflict of interest. Now, there may or may not have been an actual conflict of interest in this case. That's what you're arguing. But clearly, there is the appearance of a conflict of interest. Do you think she should have recused herself on that basis of an appearance? In the matter of inquiry and investigation, we do not know whether she recused or not. Because the SEBI press release says that all recusals that were required were in place. Therefore, it's entirely possible... Well, we, so we, know does, that, we know yeah. that she led the investigation into the Hindenburg no. allegations when they first what broke is, months ago. So she couldn't have recused herself if she led the investigation. What is led the investigation? That is my problem, really. She leads I mean, the organization even, that investigates. I mean, I have been chairperson. Sir, sir, we for may not years. know specifically yes. what it means to lead. Yes. It can be variously interpreted by people differently, but what I'm saying is, should she have been part of that investigation at all? Or should she have recused herself? Was she part of the investigation? I don't know. All but I know is that she made the presentation. She made the presentation to the parliamentary committee. That is a known fact. We do not know what her role, if any, and I mean emphasizing if any, was in the investigation. Because there's okay. a whole machinery in SEBI that looks at all these matters. They're very well trained people. So her general point, so Cheta's general point is that when there is a conflict of interest or an appearance of a conflict of interest, what I call a potential conflict of interest in cases, there should be recusal. Agreed. My problem is with whether she recuses or not. Sebi says all recusals that were required were in place. Ah, you're making a very important point, which I think is slightly different to what you've been saying up till now. So let me repeat it for the audience and correct me if I'm repeating it wrongly. You say you agree that if there's a conflict of interest or even an appearance of a conflict of interest, yes. the chairperson should have recused herself. But what we don't know is whether she did or not. What we do know from SEBI is that she recused herself in matters of potential conflicts of interest, but that is not specified to include Adani. So on the specific Adani point, we simply don't know. And you're therefore happy to give both SEBI and the chairperson what I would call the benefit of the doubt. You're assuming she did recuse herself. She therefore did the right thing. She behaved properly. No, I think we must understand that there is... No certainty on what happened. Neither you nor I or anyone else outside the organization know who's dealing with this matter, how it's being dealt with, etc. So words like she led the inquiry, etc. is neither here nor there. We know that SEBI claims in the press release that there have been recusals. And I still stay with the point 
if there is a conflict of interest or an appearance of conflict, the member or the chairperson concerned must recuse. It is not an original statement. This is okay. in the Board of so, 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 2008 December. So the, the bottom board. line, Mr. Damodran, is that you don't share the viewpoint that SEBI, either the August allegations made earlier this month, or in the case of the January 2023 allegations, mishandled it. You think whatever SEBI did, whatever the chairperson did, is adequate and proper. I have no evidence to show that it was mishandled at any point of time. Okay, sir, that is very clear. Let's then move to another issue. Now, there are also questions about the two consultancies set up by Madhavi Butch and her husband, Dhaval. Madhavi Butch, in a public statement, has said the two entities were dormant on her appointment as chairman of SEBI in 2017. They became dormant after she joined SEBI in 2017. However, Hindenburg has released documents showing that at least one of those entities is active and generating revenue. If I recall correctly, it generated around $313,000 in the three years ending this March. Is there a contradiction here? Can an entity be both declared to be dormant and yet at the same time generate over $300,000 worth of revenue? If you take the word dormant in a strict sense as the Ministry of Corporate Affairs would interpret, or as it appears in the website, dormant has a very technical, limited kind of a meaning. I do not know, and I'm not defending this, I'm just raising a doubt that appears in my mind. Did she mean dormant to mean the opposite of active and trading on a regular basis? Because it could be the company remained on the books, it was categorized active. Sir, and yet let's it not get do. technical. Dormant yeah. in English means asleep. It means inactive. It means yes. not functioning. Yes. And if a company is said to be asleep, inactive, and not functioning, and yet raises over $300,000 of revenue, is that a contradiction? Dormant might mean asleep, but it doesn't mean dead. It is, it is still around, right? Number one. Number but but two, can a company yes. that is asleep be also raising revenue at the same time? I think the best investment advisors say that when you sleep, you should be earning money. Your money should earn when you sleep. It's entirely possible. No, you're playing with words. You're not giving me a straight answer. And I will give you. I'm coming to that. Say he's I'm playing coming with to words. That. He's sliding out of it. So no, no, just, just, just give me 30 seconds to explain what I'm saying. All that I'm saying is, what is the nature of that income? Was it by way of active conduct of business? Who were these entities? Were they in any manner semi-regulated? These are all questions that people might ask and which merit answers. But it's entirely possible. I'm only speculating. I have no clue. So don't that. speculate. Give me That's a straight answer. answer. I, I don't know. A company that is I'm, I'm helping, be raised I'm helping understand the question by raising doubts that still exist in my mind. If was this interest income for earlier investments, which would have come in even if I did nothing at all? So there are possibilities. I think some clarity is needed on where this money came from. And, and I'm sure if she's not disclosed it, she will disclose it now. If she's already disclosed it, the matter is over. On So uh, you disagree with case. the view that yes. this is a contradiction? I don't think it's contradiction. It depends on what she meant by dormant. You and I are going by one meaning of dormant. It's entirely possible, as somebody has said, again, not an original statement. Somebody has said, you know, possibly what was meant was that uh, it was not active in the manner in which we understand active. In the vocabulary right. of let, the let, ministry, let, 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 let's, let's, yes. let's get out of this terminological sliding, if I can so phrase it, and let me put to you a separate Reuters story. This story was carried by the Hindu newspaper on the 17th of August, and it claims that Madhubi Butch continued to earn revenue from a consultancy firm during her tenure in SEBI. The amount is said to be 37.1 million rupees, and Ms. Butch is said to own 99% of the consultancy. Reuters says that this breaches the 2008 SEBI policy, which, and I'm quoting, 
bars officials from receiving professional fees from other professional activities. Former Finance Secretary Subhash Gar calls this a very serious breach of conduct on the part of Ms. Butch and adds that it makes her position untenable at the regulator. As a former chairman of SEBI, how do you view this revelation? So you mentioned that if somebody receives professional fees while he or she holds an office of regulator in, in SEBI, clearly if it is professional fees, it is something that uh, is wrong. It bluntly. My question is, what was the nature of this income? Was it professional fees? Was it interest income for earlier investments? What was this uh, nature of this fees? That is critical. That will determine whether it's right or In other words, if the money that was earned by the consultancy during her tenure as a member or chairperson of SEBI is interest income from previous investments, then it will not be deemed to be professional fees and therefore will not breach the 2008 SEBI policy. But Absolutely. if it is professional fees, then it will be... If it is professional policy. fees, there is a breach. And if you're it, also, yeah. if you're it is also passive a, income and that in the company's existence has been, ownership has been disclosed to SEBI, I wouldn't think that is a breach. Let me put this to you. You're therefore also confirming that the 2008 SEBI policy applies to the chairperson of SEBI. She's not exempt from it. No, no. It is actually meant only for members and chairperson. It's not meant for other employees. So the argument that she could be exempt or that she could have sought exemption from the government who appointed her does not hold in this case. Not at all. There's no case for exemption, nor would she have sought for exemption because the code is very clear. So it all turns upon the nature of the revenue that was earned. That, if, that to my mind, is critical. That if is critical. it was interest from previous investments, then it doesn't breach 2008. But if yes. it was actual professional fees, it does breach 2008. Let me put it this way. There are lots of people that hold regulatory positions that get dividends from investments that they have made, etc. Is there any active role that they play in that? They don't. Okay, I understand that. But coming right to the end of this interview, let me end by asking for your overall comment, your overall comment on the way SEBI has handled the Hindenburg affair since it first came to public knowledge 19 months ago in January 2023. Money Life says it's a textbook example of how not to handle such a situation. I'll repeat that because I think it's so important. Money Life says this is a textbook example of how not to handle such a situation. As a former chairman of SEBI, what's your opinion? I don't agree with that because uh, what do you mean by handling a situation? What the public needs to know, as I mentioned, is is there a system in place to deal with such contingencies? There is a system. Has that description of that system been complied with? We have SEBI's word that that has been complied with and we know no different. Therefore, I don't want to get into dispute on the basis of what I do not know. What is important is that SEBI's credibility as a regulator of the securities market is being questioned by an entity who is a recipient of a show cause notice now. And in this position, I think it is important not to be carried away by the allegations without any proof that they are valid. So your position, Mr. Damodran, about the allegations leveled by Hindenburg, yes. starting January 2023, including those leveled more recently this month in August 2024, your position is that apart from a few questions and issues that we've discussed, you have no serious major problem with the way either Sebi or Madhavi Butch as Sebi's chairperson has responded to them. You have no major problem at let, all. Let, let me put it this way. 24 allegations rising out of that first report have been listed by Sebi. 22, they have prepared the reports, given it to uh, the Supreme Court. Therefore, it's now 23. It's not. It's, it's not now 23. 23. It's not that they have discarded the allegation saying this has come from a short seller and we'll ignore it. They didn't do that. They actually went into those and they've given a report. You may agree, you may disagree with what they found. 
there is an appellate body. Somebody can go to the appellate body and say we think this is. So, so you're, you're agreeing with what I said. You do not have any major concern or problem with the way either Sebi or Madhavi Bhuj has responded to the Hindenburg allegation starting Jan 2023. You have no serious major problem. Let me put it differently. Let me say, had they come out with the marketplace and mounted a very spirited defense on a transactional basis and item-wise, I would have had a serious problem because that is not what we expect a regulator to do. But please respond to my question a bit more clearly. Are you agreeing that apart from a few questions and issues that you mentioned in this interview, you don't have any major serious problem with the way SEBI has responded or the way Madhavi Butch has responded to the Hindenburg allegation starting January 2023? On the basis of information that I have, I don't have any major problem. You don't have any major problem? On the basis of information that I presently have. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Then let me end by asking one issue. In the marketplace, and this was spoken quite openly, even if it was spoken behind closed doors, there were serious concerns about the way the Adani stock prices were sharply increasing well before Hindenburg came out in January 23. That concern was around for a while, for many years, to be honest. Did SEBI do a good job investigating price ramping before Hindenburg, before Hindenburg. You're asking whether SEBI did a good job? Yes, I am. Okay. I think my answer to that would be, of course, we don't know what they did, but clearly, like everyone else, SEBI must have been concerned at the near vertical price that the share prices had. What they did in relation to that, SEBI has a number of um, let's say, exercises in surveillance and investigation. And uh, this could have been one of those that got handled in the routine manner. So are you saying SEBI did a good job or are you saying SEBI did not do a good job? Which of the two? I am saying I do not have evidence to show that SEBI didn't do a good job. In other words, on the basis of what you know, you are happy to believe and say SEBI did a good job? On the basis of what I know, I believe that uh, I cannot say SEBI did a bad job. One last question. After the experience of the last few months, maybe the last year and a half, was it a mistake to appoint someone from the private sector with potential conflicts of interest as chairperson of SEBI? That is a question Rahul Gandhi has raised. Was he right to do so or has he been mistaken in doing so? No, this is not the first time that a regulatory organization has gone to the public place and got somebody. The Reserve Bank of India has been led by several distinguished governors who did not come from a government background. If that is where talent resides, you look at securities regulators worldwide. There are people that come from the private sector to be either uh, you know members or chairs of this. You need that kind of first-hand experience. But... You need to obviously address the question, is there an existing conflict or a potential conflict at the time the appointment is made? And if there isn't, I don't think there is a problem going outside the system and getting somebody. Mr. Zamozran, that is a very clear answer. I thank you for the time you've given me and I thank you for explaining these issues which are otherwise forbidding as well as complicated for lay people. 
Take thank you, Karan. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.